let's begin with the real world. Our story begins in 1961. Allow me to paint you a picture. The United States was in a war in Vietnam that would drag on for another 14 years and prove to be very unpopular, to put it mildly. Protesters had been taking to the streets since the war's start in 1955, but still in 61, the bulk of the war, and thus the bulk of the protests, had yet to happen. The second wave of feminism was just getting started, and the civil rights movement had been going since the separate but equal doctrine was overturned by the Supreme Court in Brown v. Board of Education in 1954. The 1960s was a decade of sorely needed progress for minorities and women, but none of it came easily, and we're still dealing with these important issues to this very day. So among all of this chaos, we find Stanley Lieber, a man quickly approaching 40. He had already spent some two decades in the comic book business. The industry was in bad shape. It had been in decline for some time, and so Stan had to fire his staff of writers and artists. He was alone in the empty offices of magazine management company owned by Martin Goodman. The company had hired him as a teenager for $8 a week. As we've discussed before, he wanted to write a novel, but he'd never been able to get around to it. At the time, the comics industry was printing books about scary monsters, cowboys, and stories of romance. Stan couldn't see how he could work his big ideas into those kinds of books. After the Second World War, the popularity of superheroes fell into a sharp decline. The few superhero books that had survived were all at DC Comics. The most enjoyable things Stan was writing at the time were corny jokes for magazines like Blushing Blurbs and Golfers Anonymous. And speaking of golf, it was a golf game between Martin Goodman and Jack Leibowitz from DC Comics that would lead to a huge superhero revival, or so the legend goes. But first, let's jump back in time to 1939 and Motion Picture Funnies Weekly number one. To vastly oversimplify, before Marvel was Marvel, it was Timely Comics. And in October of 1939, Timely published Marvel Comics number no. one by contracting with First Funnies Inc. to provide content. This was Funnies Inc.'s first real sell. The only other book they'd put together was Motion Picture Funnies Weekly, a promotional comic book distributed to movie theaters, or rather it was meant to be. Only eight sample copies were ever printed, seven of which were discovered in an estate sale in 1974. While Motion Picture Funnies Weekly wasn't exactly successful, it contained the first appearance of Bill Everett's Namor the Submariner, the first story that would take place in what would later come to be known as Earth 616, the main Marvel continuity. That story was expanded upon and repacked into Marvel Comics number no. one, along with Virgo's original Human Torch and other content. Fast forwarding 22 years later, in 61, the comics code was already in effect and the Silver Age of Comics was about five years old, depending on who you ask. In the very same year that Stan Lee fired his staff, National Periodicals, better known even then as DC Comics, printed The Flash of Two Worlds, kicking off what would come to be known as the DC Multiverse card in the upper right-hand corner. This would quickly lead to the creation of the Justice League, a new take on 1940s Justice Society. It was a hit. Goodman came back from his golf game with Leibowitz with a brand new plan. Bring superheroes back to Marvel Comics and copy DC's fancy new Justice League book. Lee wasn't so sure. He'd seen attempts to revive superheroes come and go. He was about to quit. Lucky for us, his wife Joan gave him some sound advice, and Lee decided that he would work his big ideas into these new books. If the powers that be at Marvel didn't like it, they could just fire him. Spoiler alert. He did not get fired. I cover all of this in greater detail in our videos on Stan Lee, the Justice League, and the Fantastic Four. And speaking of Marvel's first family, Fantastic Four number one, drawn by Jack Kirby, a legend in his own right, even at the time, was released on November 8th of 1961. It was Marvel's first attempt at a superhero team. It was different from what DC was offering at the same time, a sign of things to come. By 1962, the company had abandoned all the different names it published under and rebranded as Marvel Comics. Spider-Man and the Hulk also came along in 62. 1963 gave us Iron Man and the X-Men. Marvel was on a roll. 
So that's the creation of the main Marvel Universe, but when did it become a multiverse? Well, for that answer, we've got to switch gears and look into the actual continuity. The first mention of a multiverse came with Doctor Strange. In November of 1965, we got Strange Tales number 138, wherein Stephen Strange meets Eternity. Now, Eternity is a celestial being an anthropomorphic manifestation of reality. Uh, let's just quote Marvel.com directly. Eternity came into existence when the universe was formed, along with siblings Death, Oblivion, and Infinity, who is often said to be one with Eternity, and spontaneously assumed the collective consciousness of all living things in the universe. He is every living thing, and every living thing is him. In 1967, we learned more about celestial beings in the Eternals from comic legend Jack Kirby. The very first universe to ever exist was embodied in a being called the First Firmament. In his loneliness, he became the creator of both the Celestials and the Aspirants. The Celestials wanted their own creations to live and evolve. In fact, they created the main Marvel Universe, but the Aspirants were not down with that plan. For now, all you need to know is that these two groups went to war and shattered the first firmament into the second cosmos and the first multiverse. So the multiverse formed a cycle of renewal and this process repeated until eternity became the embodiment of the eighth cosmos and the seventh multiverse. Now, I have way oversimplified this. The Marvel multiverse is complex and the information is often kind of vague and sometimes even contradictory. Explaining it all would take several hours and this is just supposed to be a base explanation, and we're not even done yet. We'll get into Marvel's latest creation story, as told in Jonathan Hickman's Avengers, in more detail in part two, where we will also discuss the first mention of Earth 616 in the real world, the sliding time scale under which Marvel's continuity functions, the naming scheme used to identify each reality, and more. Welcome back to Into the Omniverse. So, a very quick recap. In part one, we discussed the superhero revival of the 1960s and how that led to the creation of the Marvel Universe. We talked about the first stories that took place in what would come to be known as Earth 616, the first mention of Marvel's multiverse, and the celestial beings. You can watch that video by clicking the card in the upper right hand corner. Now, not all comic book reboots are technically reboots. Some of them are just relaunches where books are set back to issue one, while others may be partially reboots or simple changes in continuity brought on as part of a story, a retcon if you're nasty. The purpose of all these events is the same. Simplify continuity and create a good point for new readers to jump in. I'm going to call them all reboots, so complain in the comment section below, frankly, I could use the engagement numbers. Those of you that watched my two-part series explaining DC's multiverse will recall that a large portion of those videos was dedicated to the various crisis events DC has implemented, and Marvel has done reboots and relaunch events as well. However, DC started rebooting its comic lines in 1986 with Crisis on Infinite Earths, while Marvel was a decade late to the reboot party with Heroes Reborn in 1996. Marvel, for their part, has kept reboots to a minimum, until they didn't. I think this may be a good time to explain the sliding time scale. You see, anything that ever happened in Marvel's continuity happened in the last 10 or 15 years, and this time scale is constantly sliding forward, but it also causes problems. Tony Stark's origin story, for example, took place during the Vietnam War. Now it's Afghanistan. So rebooting all or part of Marvel's comic universe is a great way to clean up lost bits of continuity. DC does the same thing, but it's less relevant to the DC multiverse because they reboot every other 15 minutes, don't at me. The name Earth 616 was first used in July of 1983 in Rough Justice, a story from Alan Moore and artist Alan Davis for Marvel UK in The Daredevils, though it was later reprinted in the Captain Britain trade paperback and Alan Davis claims it was previous Captain Britain writer David Thorpe who first coined the term, though Moore claims he came up with it. In any case, this format would stick and all future Marvel universes would be referred to as Earth-A 
and then a number. Moore says he chose the number at random simply to avoid copying DC's Earth 1 and Earth 2, though it's commonly believed that 616 was chosen to honor the year and month of the Fantastic Four's debut in 1961. But that was cover dated November and released in August, months 8 and 9, so I'm not sure that scans. Maybe they began work on it in June, that would be year 61 in the sixth month. David Thorpe in a 2020 interview agreed with Davis and said that the number 50 was subtracted from 666 to arrive at 616, though he also notes that Moore was the first one to print the term. The truth is, we may never really know what happened, and it's likely some combination of these stories. From Rough Justice to the first Marvel reboot was about 13 years. After that, Marvel got a taste for the practice, and so we had Ultimate Marvel in 2000, Secret Wars in 2015, all new, all different Marvel again in 2015, don't get me started, Marvel Now in 2016, Marvel Legacy in 2017, and Fresh Start in 2018, which intended to bring Marvel back to basics. And that brings us to the Marvel Universe. As told in Jonathan Hickman's Avengers, it's extremely long, so let's stick to the creation of the multiverse, but it starts like this. There was nothing, followed by everything. Swirling, burning specks of creation that circled life-giving suns. And then we raced to the light. It was the spark that started a fire, a legend that grew in the telling. Some believe it began the moment Hyperion was rescued from a dying universe. Others say it was when the guard were broken on the dead moon. Many more think it was when Ex Nilo terraformed Mars, turning the red planet green. They are all wrong, as it happened before the light, before the war, and before the fall. It started with two men. It started with an idea. We then cut to Tony Stark waking up Steve Rogers, who seems to be dreaming about the Illuminati, and then they have a conversation. The basic idea is this. If the threats keep escalating, then there's just one simple solution to that problem. The Avengers must get bigger. Now, explaining the whole story would take hours. In fact, Rob has a nine-hour compilation video on this topic, along with Secret Wars, and he did a fantastic job laying out the whole story. I'll link it here if you want to check it out. It's outside the scope of this video, so we'll stick to it explaining the multiverse, but suffice it to say, this leads into Secret Wars. To keep it short, a month after Tony decides the Avengers must get bigger, he's proven correct when Ex Nilo, Aleph, and Abyss start attacking Earth from the newly terraformed Mars, and the Avengers get their asses handed to them, partially because Abyss is able to manipulate Hulk into fighting Thor by essentially telling him that this guy thinks he's stronger than you, but it's more than that. There seems to be some kind of magic that keeps Hulk loyal. So, they send Cap back to Earth as sort of a statement. The best you have couldn't stand against us, and we cannot be stopped. So Cap calls in everyone he can using the Wake the World protocol. This is the idea that started it all. So keep that in your back pocket while I tell you about the builders. This is kind of a small retcon, but it leaves most of the continuity already established and just exists with it. The builders were the first race in the cosmos, or that's what Ex Nilo says. They believed themselves to be a perfect people. For a time, Time, they worshipped a goddess they called the Mother Maker that they essentially believed was the universe itself, but they moved away from religion as they evolved as a society. They built systems to control and direct the very fabric of space and time. The first of these systems were beings called Aleph's and known as gardeners. They searched for and purged species that they believed were unfit for their new universe. So the character Aleph was one of these gardeners, and he raised world world after world, deeming them all unfit. However, one day after literally hundreds of millions of years, he finally found a species that he felt was worthy of preservation and evolution. There he released the garden he carried within him, seeding the planet with all sorts of seeds, no two of which were the same. This kicks off a chaotic evolutionary process that eventually gives birth to Ex Nilo and Abyss. So these three continue on their mission to transform the universe, and of course their new target is Earth. They don't want to destroy it though, they've deemed it worthy of evolution, and this, we find out, is really bad for the people living there now. These evolution bombs cause people to be encased in a pod that speeds up their evolution. This happens all over the world, a full-scale global attack. Eventually, Captain Universe shows up, and because the builders worshipped the universe, two of them, Ex Nilo and Abyss, immediately stop. If the universe tells them to stop destroying and transforming, then that's good enough for them. 
Lilith, on the other hand, isn't buying it. He's created and hard-coded for this, so Captain Universe destroys him. So there's a whole lot more to this story. Seriously, I left out a lot, but that's the basic facts that affect the creation of the Marvel multiverse, or this incarnation of it. Eventually, this becomes the base that Hickman builds on to take us to the collapse of this multiverse, to Secret Wars, and to all new, all different Marvel. The multiverse collapsed in what was called the Incursions, described as a contraction in the multiverse's timeline. During an incursion, two universes of the multiverse collide, destroying both, and each time this happens, the lifespan of the multiverse gets a little shorter. The Illuminati and the Cabal tried to stop the incursions, but ultimately, the multiverse is doomed. The only sure way to prevent an incursion is for one of the parallel Earths to be destroyed, which causes some ethical issues. Those of you that saw Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness may find this whole premise to be familiar. You might also remember me doing a video on Drake's channel about four times that Deadpool actually died. This was number one, the final incursion. Earth 1610, the ultimate universe, and Earth 616, the last two universes left, go boom. And after an all-out battle, this version of the multiverse ends. Secret Wars from 84 and 85, where Spidey got his symbiote costume for the first time, has a lot in common with Hickman's 2015 Secret Wars. So, in short, a being called the Beyonder becomes fascinated by the superheroes on Earth. The Beyonder chooses a group of heroes and villains to send to a planet in a distant galaxy called Battleworld. It's got alien tech and weapons, and all of the heroes and villains are pitted against one another. The whole planet is made up of pieces of thousands of other worlds, including including one Denver suburb from Earth, which still exists along with the rest of the universe while the events on Battleworld play out. In Hickman's Secret Wars, the planet is made by Doom after he takes the Beyonder's powers in order to save what's left of the multiverse, and the world is made up of bits of the old multiverse. In this version, the Beyonders are destroying the multiverse as part of an experiment, how very Star Trek. Doom, with the help of Molecule Man, kills them and steals their power. There was nothing, followed by everything. Swirling, burning specks of creation that circled life-giving suns. God Doom created the light. Then there was Earth. The firmament cooled, and he raised up the land, this holy land, the world. And upon it, he set his kingdoms. So Battleworld has its own history, structure, and laws. It's ruled by God Doom. The police are all Thor. Seriously, there's a Thor core. Johnny Storm was apparently punished by forcing him to become the sun, and some also worship him as a deity. There are no stars, but nowhere still exists as Battleworld's moon. No one there remembers the old multiverse. They think they've always lived on Battleworld, except the sheriff, Doctor Strange. That is, until eight years after the creation of Battleworld, two groups of survivors from the two final universes arrive. So, Mr. Fantastic and the Maker eventually find Doom's source of power, and while Castle Doom is under assault by Maximus, who gathered an army to try and defeat God Emperor Doom, don't know why you need both of those, but you do you, Victor. Mr. Fantastic and God Emperor Doom battle it out, but Molecule Man gets involved and gives Reed Doom's power. Battleworld begins to break down. Reed uses this power to restore the previous multiverse, but the one he creates is forever changed. It's essentially a new multiverse for an all-new, all-different Marvel, where Earth-616 and 1610 are combined. This became the eighth cosmos, and though many events have happened since, Eternity War, Infinity Conflict, and Civil War II, for example, this is still the current incarnation of Marvel's multiverse. Both versions of Secret Wars are similar. Battleworld, Doom getting ultimate power, heroes pitted against one another, but in the end, there are different stories. The original is a superhero romp with some weird plot plot points, but some cool moments, while the 2015 version is an epic tale spanning years and multiple series. I've left out so much, but this video is about the multiverse, not just this one story. Though, to be fair, it's a super important story to the history of the multiverse. Hey guys, today I want to talk about Marvel's first family. However, before we get into that, I cooked up this serum. I had it sent into space and bombarded by cosmic rays. So if my calculations are correct, once I drink this, I should have the powers of the human torch. Bottoms up. Ah! Oh God. Oh. C the aftertaste is even worse. All right, here we go. 
flame on! Oh my god, it burns! It burns! Jesus Christ, help me! Our story begins with an argument. Pilot Ben Grimm is deeply concerned that if he flies to the stars, the cosmic rays could be dangerous. In fact, they could kill everyone aboard the spaceship. Fortunately for Dr. Reed Richards and his ill-defined experiment, Sue Storm demands that they quote, beat the commies and cause Ben a coward. This causes Ben to go full Marty McFly and declare that he'll do it no matter the consequences. And so, under the cover of night, the team sneaks into a spaceport conveniently located on the outskirts of town. Susan declares that she's going up in the spaceship as well because she's Dr. Reed's fiance. Likewise, Johnny Storm declares that he's going with his sister no matter where she goes because that's totally how that works. So all four head toward the rocket and take off before the guards can stop them. There's simply no time to get clearance, apparently, even though Dr. Reed literally spent years building the ship himself. Unfortunately, just as Ben feared, the ship's shielding isn't strong enough and they're all bombarded by cosmic rays. Back on Earth, after a rough but safe landing, the team finds out that something is different. Dr. Reed can now stretch any part of his body to fantastic proportions. Susan Storm can make herself invisible, Ben Grimm transformed into some sort of thing, and hot-headed Johnny Storm can burst into flames and fly. The four decide to use these fantastic powers to help mankind, and so was born the Fantastic Four. In the early 1960s, Martin Goodman, owner of Marvel Comics, noticed that rival company National Periodicals, better known even then as DC Comics, was doing very well with their fancy new superhero team. He was jealous. You see, the Justice League were the talk of the industry. Superhero teams were back in a big way. Goodman asked Marvel's editor and chief writer Stan Lee to create a team for Marvel Comics. According to legend, Lee was considering leaving the comics industry at the time. He felt he wasn't being given the creative freedom to write what he wanted. His wife Joan, however, had a different way of looking at the situation. Marvel Comics was in a bad way at the time. In fact, the entire industry was suffering. She figured this was the perfect perfect distraction, and according to comics creators on Fantastic Four, she said something to the effect of, if no one's looking, you may as well write what you want. Artist Jack Kirby had just left National Periodicals. One of the projects he helped create there was a team of four adventure seekers called the Challengers of the Unknown. Although sources vary, both David Wood and Joe Simon have been credited as co-creators. Like Stan Lee, Kirby too saw the decline of Marvel Comics as an opportunity. No one was paying much attention, and that afforded them some extra breathing room, creatively speaking. Kirby became the co-creator of Fantastic Four and issue number Number one was released in November of 1961 using the now famous and somewhat controversial Marvel method. Although it's never been stated officially, at least to my knowledge, it's pretty obvious that Kirby brought ideas to the Fantastic Four project that were first conceived for Challengers of the Unknown. Lee and Kirby's collaboration also included the Hulk, Thor, Iron Man, the original X-Men, Doctor Doom, and just so many more. Goodman asked for a Justice League knockoff, but what he got was something entirely different. For the first two issues, the Fantastic Four didn't even wear costumes. The covers prominently featured a monster of the week, there were no secret identities to be found, and plans for the team to wear masks were scrapped. The Fantastic Four were more of a family than a team, and like a family, they didn't always get along. They made mistakes, they had character flaws, they argued a lot. These differences may sound minor, but it was different than what most people were accustomed to seeing. The final product didn't look, feel, or read like a superhero book. Writers working at the time have described it as a comics culture shock. The fans took notice. 
I've said this before in my Iron Man editorial, link in the upper right hand corner, but generally speaking, Marvel is about men and women trying to be gods, while DC is about gods trying to be men and women. Now, there are lots of examples of both Marvel and DC getting away from that dynamic and doing something different. It's more of an overall feel than a hard and fast rule. However, very broadly speaking, Marvel's heroes are people with relatable problems that get superpowers. DC's heroes are larger than life archetypes that represent everything we strive to be but never can. The Fantastic Four was the start of this contrast. Marvel would get its own team of heroes united from the pages of their own solo comics just a couple of years later. The Avengers were different in many of the same ways that the Fantastic Four were, but they made a much better analog to the Justice League than the Fantastic Four ever did. Back in 1986, Little J turned five years old. Neon colors were all the rage, hair was as large as humanly possible, and German producer Bernd Eichinger bought the rights to Marvel's Fantastic Four. He tried to get large studios on board, including Warner Brothers and Columbia Pictures, but no one was interested. Even the success of 1989's Batman failed to attract any takers. The rights were set to expire in 1992. To keep them, he'd have to make a movie but it didn't have to be a good movie, it didn't even technically have to be released. So Eichinger hired Roger Corman, a veteran of the B-movie scene, to help make a very cheap Fantastic Four movie. Despite trailers that promised a release, one was never planned. In the end, Marvel executive A.B. Arad bought the rights to the film in order to return it to the fires of Morador. And by that, I mean he literally tried to destroy every copy. Unfortunately, he failed, and copies can be found online even to this day. Perhaps he should have used an old priest and a young priest to cast out the evil instead. Yeah. References. Oddly, Eschinger's production company, Constantine Film, would go on to produce two big-budget Fantastic Four films starting in 2005. Chris Evans, who played the Human Torch, would go on to play Captain America in the Marvel Cinematic Universe starting in 2011. Jessica Alba played the Invisible Woman. Johan Griffith and Michael Chitlis played Reed Richards and Ben Grimm, respectively. The sequel, entitled Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer, hit theaters in 2007 but was not well received by critics and fans. If people were lukewarm to Rise of the Silver Surfer, they were downright hostile to fan stick. Rumors claimed the production company had issues and the director and studio clashed. This led to a round of reshoots that, because of Kate Mara's awful wig, stick out like a sore thumb. It was truly the Henry Cavill's mustache of 2015. Michael B. Jordan, who played the Human Torch in that reboot, would also go on to find his place in the MCU as Killmonger longer in 2018's Black Panther. So take note, if you want a guaranteed spot in the MCU, then just play the Human Torch in a terrible movie. This version also included Miles Taylor as Reed Richards, Kate Mara as Sue Storm, and Jamie Bell as Ben Grimm. 30 years before Evans ever flamed on, the role was taken on by none other than Bill Murray. Murray voiced the Human Torch in a 1975 radio play that lasted for 10 episodes and was narrated by Stan Lee himself. The Fantastic Four have also been featured in many animated TV shows over the years, including but not necessarily limited to Fantastic Four in 1967, the new Fantastic Four in 1978, the Marvel Action Hour in 1989, Fantastic Four in 1994, and Fantastic Four World's Greatest Heroes in 2006. Oddly, the team was cut from the 1998 animated series The Silver Surfer. That series was cancelled after one season, the result of legal disputes between Marvel and Sabian Entertainment, the company responsible for the Power Rangers and this terrible Ninja Turtles adaptation. The Fantastic Four series lasted for 645 issues over the course of of 54 years before it was cancelled in April of 2015. The actual number of issues where the team appears is much higher. Marvel has a habit of overcomplicating issue numbering, and there are lots of miniseries, solo or team-up books, and various guest appearances that don't count.
So if you'll allow me to put on my tinfoil hat for a moment, in 2014, the website Bleeding Cool began reporting that they believed the Fantastic Four would be canceled. Evidently, it all came down to a dispute with Fox, who owns the movie rights to the Fantastic Four and the X-Men. This was denied by Tom Brevoort, executive editor and senior vice president of publishing at Marvel. However, the rumors and reports, which were not without some evidence, cited that Marvel even went so far as to remove artwork featuring the Fantastic Four from the company office walls. Reports stated that Marvel chair Ike Perlmutter made the decision after meeting with Fox executives over the future of the Fantastic Four movie rights. Apparently, the X-Men comics were selling well, so they were safe from cancellation, but Perlmutter ordered that both X-Men and Fantastic Four were to get no internal promotion unless the Avengers would get equal billing, and Axis did seem to give them oddly even billing on the covers. All licensing and publicity was to be cancelled wherever possible. As predicted, Marvel cancelled the Fantastic Four comics, first Ultimate Fantastic Four, and then Fantastic Four. Of course, lots of comic runs sort of ended before Secret Wars, but Fantastic Four did not come back. Reports of cancelled posters, statues, trading cards, and other merchandise appeared in various articles. Jonathan Hickman, a previous Fantastic Four writer, confirmed the reasoning behind the comic book cancellations in an August 2017 article by George Marston on Newsarama. Quote, I think it's pretty common knowledge at this point that Marvel isn't publishing Fantastic Four because of their disagreement with Fox. We knew a year or so out that the Fantastic Four as a property wasn't going to be published at Marvel past 2015. By the end of 2017, things were changing. New licensing deals began to pop up for X-Men, no similar restrictions were ever introduced for Deadpool, Legion, or The Gifted, and Hasbro even got to make a new Susan Storm figurine. Then, in March of this year, it's 2018 for you future viewers, Marvel announced that they would begin publishing a new Fantastic Four comic series in August. After three years, it looks like the team is returning home to the Baxter building. So, in the end, I can't say which rumors were true and which were not. The books were cancelled, we do know that. The good news in all of this, however, is that the Fantastic Four is coming back to a comic shop near you. Hashtag not sponsored. So, this video is much longer than previous Do You Know Comics installments, and yet, as I type this, I can't help but feel that it doesn't have the same amount of random trivia that other episodes offered. So, let's do a lightning round. Reed Richards and Sue Storm once joined the Avengers, but still wore the same Fantastic Four uniforms. During the Infernal crossover, the demon Nastir kidnapped Franklin, Sue, and Reed's son. To get him back, they joined forces with Gilgamesh, Thor, and the Captain. Long story short, he's Steve Rogers, and by issue 300, the group decided they were the Avengers. The team was disbanded at the time, so the name was up for grabs, I guess. Reed and Sue left the team after only a few issues. So we have yet to discuss Doctor Doom. The team's nemesis was once called upon by Johnny Storm to help deliver Sue and Reed's baby girl, which is weird because I don't think he's that kind of doctor. In exchange for helping with what was a very difficult and dangerous birth, Doom asked to name the little girl. He chose the name Valeria after a woman he loved, and also killed, because he's Doctor Doom. Dude needs to change his surname. I mean, what do you expect from a kid named Victor Von Doom? Marvel uses what's called a sliding time scale. Basically, any new story you read is set now, and all older stories happened sometime within the last 10 or 15 years. This keeps the comics perpetually in the present. That's a good thing, too, as most of Marvel's heavy hitters were created in the 60s during the Silver Age of comics. However, this leads to some continuity issues. For example, Silver Age Fantastic Four comics depict Reed and Ben fighting in World War II. This is why the occasional universe reboot is necessary to clean the slate, even if Marvel tends to overdo it, you know, a bit. When promoting Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer, Fox and the Franklin Mint wanted to create 40,000 real quarters that would display the Silver Surfer on one side. The US Mint passed on the idea. And finally, in the late 1970s, The Thing appeared in a show called Fred and Barney Meet the Thing. Despite the title, they never actually met. Instead, the show featured two separate cartoons, one episode of the new Fred and Barney show and one episode of The Thing. At this 
time, Marvel Comics owned the rights to several Hanna-Barbera franchises and even published comics about them. In the show, Benji Grimm would transform by touching two rings together and yelling, Thing ring, do your thing! So, why wasn't this listed above when I discussed Fantastic Four cartoons? Well, it didn't include any other team members, and the Thing was a totally different character aside from his familiar orange rock appearance. Marvel Comics No. 1 was released in 1939, but the Fantastic Four marked the true start of the Marvel Universe. In 1961, Marvel released Fantastic Four No. 1, and the company's first superhero team set it on a course that would turn a small division of a publishing company into a pop culture phenomenon. Lee and Kirby landed an unexpected hit, and when it began to receive fan mail, Lee started printing the letters in a column with issue number 3. He slapped the world's greatest comic magazine on the covers, a tradition that continued into the 1990s and even appeared on select issues in the 2000s. This combination of hyperbole and direct, often frank communication with fans served to set Marvel apart and gave it a different feel. That all began with Marvel's first family, both literally and figuratively. Nearly 60 years later, they're still fantastic. The tagline Earth's Mightiest Heroes was used in the title of the 2010 animated series and in a line of dialogue spoken by Robert Downey Jr. as Tony Stark. However, it first appeared on the cover of Avengers No. 1 way back in September of 1963 as Earth's Mightiest Heroes with a dash. In fact, the Avengers has been in print for more than 50 years. Marvel is nearing issue 700 with the Avengers, although that number could be significantly higher if Marvel counted every title containing the word Avengers. Marvel has a long history of weird issue numbers. For example, in 1968, The Incredible Hulk took over the issue numbering from Tales to Astonish, and Captain America took over the issue numbering from Tales of Suspense, both of which began in 1979 so it goes with the Avengers as well. Sometimes it uses the classic numbering system, sometimes issues get reset to number one and run with new numbers for a while, sometimes both numbers will appear on the books for a bit, and as previously mentioned, some Avengers comics count toward the legacy total, while others do not. Frankly, it's a hot mess. In five decades, the Avengers team roster has at one time or another included more than 100 members, with some counts as high as 116. If we include teams besides the main Avengers group like the West Coast Avengers, the Young Avengers, Avengers Third Grade, a huge list of honorary Avengers and a ton of others, then every single hero who's ever had any association to the Avengers team brings us up to more than 160 superpowered individuals. In the 2012 Marvel Cinematic Universe blockbuster The Avengers, Agent Coulson's vintage Captain America cards contained a nod to the iconic 1941 comic book cover that saw Captain America punch Hitler right in his stupid little tiny mustache. Joss Whedon has stated that the movie is heavily influenced by the 1960s Avengers comics. He was quoted as saying, In those comics, these people shouldn't be in the same room, let alone on the same team, and that is the definition of family. So I just want to take a moment in the middle of the video here to remind you that if you're enjoying the content, then please click the thumbs up button. It really does help the channel grow. Quickly getting back to the matter at hand, Marvel did not bother to trademark the name The Avengers until 1970. The Avengers was also the name of a 1960s spy series, and this led to the movie being retitled in some markets, which is why the film was called Marvel's Avengers Assemble in the UK. In Japan, the movie's tagline translates to roughly, Hey Japan, this is a movie. This was intended to be a humorous jab at Japanese culture, but some were quite offended by the tagline. They felt that it was in poor taste, with one columnist equating the tagline with the statement, Hey native people, this is culture. While the Hulk was a founding member of the Avengers, he left in issue number two and fought against the Avengers in issue number three. Of course, this would not be the last time the Hulk would find himself in the ranks of the Avengers. Hulk wasn't the only founding member to leave the team early on. In fact, only 16 issues in, nearly the entire team roster was changed. That roster included Iron Man, Giant Man, Wasp, and Thor, who were replaced by reformed supervillains Hawkeye, 
Scarlet Witch, and Quicksilver. Captain America stayed on to run the new team. In the MCU, Cap was labeled as the first Avenger, right there in the title. But within the pages of the original comics, he was late to the party, joining the team in issue number four, when they found his frozen body while chasing down Namor the Submariner. Namor had teamed with Hulk to fight the Avengers, but when he suddenly reverted to Bruce Banner, Puny Banner ran away, leaving the Submariner to fend for himself. When working on the first Avengers movie, Joss Whedon wanted to include Ant-Man and the Wasp, both founding members of the team in the original comics. However, the movie already had too many characters. An earlier draft of the script did feature the Wasp, but once Johansson was confirmed as Black Widow, Wasp was written out. By the time the Avengers Age of Ultron came around, Ant-Man and the Wasp were already being used in the Ant-Man solo film, which was in development at the time. Whedon was quoted as saying, Of all the heat I've ever taken, not having Hank Pym was one of the bigger things. But the fact of the matter was, Edgar had him first by virtue of what Edgar was doing. There was no way for me to use him in this. Avengers Age of Ultron was released in May of 2015, with Ant-Man coming just two months later in July. The Avengers was also one of the earliest comics to address the issues of the civil rights movement in the 1960s. In Avengers number 32, the team battled the Sons of the Serpent, a thinly veiled stand-in for the Ku Klux Klan. According to Marvel Comics' The Untold Story, between 1957 and 1968, DC Comics was Marvel's distributor. Before the industry's near collapse in 1957, Marvel put out an astonishing 40 to 50 comic titles per month. After the collapse, Marvel had little choice but to use DC as their distributor. At first, DC limited Marvel to just 8 books per month, but by 1964 they were up to 16, still a far cry from what Stan Lee and his team had put out prior to the industry crash. When Marvel released Avengers and X-Men, the company had to cancel two other comics because of this limit. The books that got the axe were titled Love Romances and Gunsmoke Western. Had they been more popular, Avengers and X-Men might not have ever seen the light of day. In the MCU, Spider-Man was invited to join the Avengers and turned the offer down to remain a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Astonishingly, in the comics, Spidey didn't join the team until Brian Michael Bendis added him with the launch of the new Avengers in 2004. There are several examples of Spidey almost joining different Avengers teams, but it took four decades before Peter Parker ever made it official. Many people are surprised to find out that Nick Fury, within the main Marvel Comics continuity known as Earth-616, is a Caucasian World War II veteran. When designing the ultimate universe known as Earth-1610, artist Brian Hitch modeled the ultimate version of Nick Fury after actor Samuel L. Jackson. This was in the year 2000, well before the Marvel Cinematic Universe and Jackson's casting as Nick Fury in that universe. The MCU is Earth-199999, in case you were curious. But it gets even more complicated. After the movies were successful, the continuity of the main Marvel Universe was retroactively changed, something nerds like myself call a retcon. The short version is that they gave Fury a son, Nick Fury Jr., who just happened to be a black dude who was also a dead ringer for Samuel L. Jackson. Fury Jr. took over for his father, and now Marvel Comics has a Nick Fury to match the MCU and Ultimate Universe. Who is Gwenpool? Well, created by Chris Bacello, Marvel's Gwenpool is a character that combines Deadpool and Gwen Stacy. Well, sort of. You see, back in June of 2015, Spider-Gwen was all the rage. And why not? Spider-Gwen is awesome. Consequently though, Marvel smelled money. How much money are we talking about? And so they published alternate covers for all of their titles, featuring Gwen Stacy crossed with other Marvel characters, hoping for a hit. One such cover was Bocello's variant cover for Deadpool's Secret Secret Wars 2. Two secrets. No more, no less. The comic giant was hoping one of these Gwyn mashups would take off, and boy did it ever. Suddenly, people were cosplaying as a character that had no backstory or comic issues to speak of. So Marvel editor Jordan White asked writer Christopher Hastings and editor Heather Antos to create a story featuring the character. 
This resulted in a one-shot called Gwyn Pool Special No. 1 in December of 2015, but a month earlier in November, Gwyn Pool would be introduced to readers in a backup story within Howard the Duck over the course of three issues. Hastings would go on to write Gwyn Pool for an entire five-volume run with art by these guys who make up Guri Hero Studios. Hastings once said to Entertainment Weekly, quote, We are telling an interesting story here. We're not just making up a reason to buy comics based on a popular cosplay character. And you know what? I buy that. Hastings wasn't even aware of the hype around Gwynpool and had to be told by editor Jordan White about the cosplayers that showed up to San Diego Comic-Con dressed as the character. Frankly, this could have very easily turned into a soulless cash grab, but rather than fart out a story about an alternate Gwyn Stacy that ended up in Weapon X, Hastings pitched something far more original. You see, Gwendolyn Poole was a real person from our universe that became trapped within the main Marvel universe. She had no powers to speak of apart from a penchant for excessive violence and lots of guns. However, she was an avid comic book fan, and so what she did have was a lot of information about the Marvel universe, including the secret identities and internal motivations of nearly all the Marvel heroes and villains, limited, of course, to what she personally read back in her original universe. Universe. The really interesting bit, however, is in how Gwen sees the people around her. Because she knows that she's in a comic book, she doesn't believe there are any consequences to her actions. Hastings once described it like this, Gwen acts like she's in a video game. She doesn't see anyone that she encounters within the Marvel Universe as a real person, at least not initially, and this leads her to act like she's playing Grand Theft Auto. She even gets her jobs from a character called Ronnie the Tailor, who made her superhero hero suit and works as a broker offering freelance jobs for mercenaries, a situation that feels a whole lot like how one would get new mission assignments in a game by Rockstar. This attitude gave the character more than just an original backstory and some motivation. It also gave her an interesting philosophy and some room to learn and grow as a character. So Gwen, knowing that she didn't want to be an extra, uses a combination of money, guns, and insider comic info to live the life of a superhero or a supervillain. Yeah, she's initially really bad at being a hero because of her no one is real but me attitude. And when she first appeared in Howard the Duck volume six number one, she stole a virus capable of destroying humanity and sold it to Hydra. She does, however, do the right thing in the end, partly because the Avengers are busy in space. More often than not, Gwynpool is a bit out of her league when it comes to superhero-ing, but fortune favors the bold. And also, she believes that she's the main character who can't be written out of the story. In her introduction, she even drives a motorcycle off a building and then says, I'm very curious how I'll survive this. She landed on some feathers, just in case you guys were curious too. Unfortunately, these feathers weren't in some pillows. They were attached to ducks, much to Howard's dismay. In any case, I found Gwynpool to be fun and interesting. There are moments that truly make you smile as you see yourself in Gwyn as a comic book fan and perhaps even envy her as she makes her way through the Marvel Universe. Like, why don't I get to meet Spider-Man? Yet, she's forever different from any other character in the Marvel Universe. Her belief that her world is real and the Marvel Universe is fictional leads her to make choices that are morally and ethically questionable but really interesting. Amid all the funny gags and ongoing plot lines, there's this existential horror that's always there in the background. There's something about being the only real person in the universe that I find fascinating and terrifying all at the same time, and I love it. I know, fact list videos are so 2016, but never fear true believers, I'm bringing it back. I'm going to tell you 17 things you might not know about Gwynpool. You know who is probably not Gwynpool? My patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to join the Patreon, the link is in the description below. Sometimes you get early access to videos and scripts, and you can even request a video on a topic or character of your choice. If you can't do Patreon, then share, like, and comment on the video. Every little bit helps. Let's jump right in. Number one. Gwen's powers have been expanded since she and her brother Teddy arrived in the Marvel Universe. At first, she just knew things she shouldn't because 
she reads comics in her own universe, so plot lines, secret identities, stuff like that. Plus, she breaks the fourth wall, nothing you didn't know there. She also arguably had the power of plot convenience. She would do things like drive a motorcycle off a building and be assured that she would survive because, well, the story was not yet over and she was the main character. Whether that is a superpower or not is up to your own interpretation, but now she does have some bona fide powers. She can hide in the white space between panels, what she calls gutter space, manipulate items in other panels and pages, or even pull people and objects from other storylines. On top of all of that, she can retcon things to have already happened at will using a flashback, or as Gwynpool Strikes Back number one put it, she can alter reality by manipulating whatever happens off panel. This is, of course, crazy overpowered, but they keep it in check by working the concept of editorial oversight right into the story. So why does it Gwynpool have the same level of power in team ups that she has in her solo book because the editors won't allow it. It's pretty genius. Number 2. In the unbelievable Gwynpool, which started in 2016 and ran for two years, during issue number 18, Gwyn uses her newly obtained powers to answer fan letters in the back of the comic, standing in for editor Heather Anthos, who began the letters column two issues before. This section is called Gwyn's Pool, or Pile of Ordinary Letters to the Editor, and becomes a reoccurring feature of the series. Number 3. In issue number 19, we meet a future evil version of Gwynpool with powers that future Miles Morales describes as impossible to fight. Apparently, in this alternate future, Gwen might as well be omnipotent, and she's also evil. Gwen erases her by deciding to never do the things that future evil Gwenpool did. Number 4. Gwynpool appeared in Deadpool Kills the Marvel Universe again, cover dated September 2017. This five-issue miniseries brought back writer Colin Bunn and artist Dalibor Tijak from the original Deadpool Kills the Marvel Universe, and we actually get to see Deadpool and Gwynpool fight. He calls her a variant knockoff cover even. As you can imagine from the title, this does not end well for this alternate Gwyn, but she does play a pivotal role in the plot. Number 5. She also appears in Rocket Raccoon and Groot issues 8, 9, and 10. Many sources say 7 through 10, but they're counting the preview of issue 8's cover at the end of issue 7. This story takes place during Civil War II and basically serves to keep Gwen sidelined during the big event. Also, it featured an alien race that looks human, except they don't have noses. Now that is a thing that you know. Number 6. Gwen is also in issues 4 and 5 of the 2016 run of Champions, and while issue 4 4 isn't necessary to get the full story, I count it because unlike in the previous example, she does actually get one panel in addition to the preview of the next issue's cover. She spends the whole issue insisting that there's a supervillain behind a crooked racist sheriff because comics work that way. Obviously, she was wrong. The lesson being that things like racism and by extension misogyny, homophobia, transphobia are all alive and well even in the West and it doesn't take magic or superpowers to create corrupt institutions. So instead of waiting for the final boss of racism to reveal itself, we should all take a stand and call it out when we see it, even if that means speaking truth to power. The issue had a real, very special episode vibe, and I liked it. What can I say? I grew up in the 90s. I'm a sucker for a very special episode. Number 7. Gwynpool Holiday Special Merry Mix-Up, and this is true, contains a story where Red Skull gets upset when Hydra merges with several other evil groups, and the greeting gets changed from Hell Hydra to Hell Hatred in order to be more inclusive. The story is resolved when the ghost of Hitler visits him in a Christmas Carol parody to take him back in time and remind him of the true meaning of hatred. This book also contains an alarming amount of hot pants. Here's Punisher in some hot pants. Number 8. There's also an alternate universe Gwen in Edge of Venomverse issue number 2 from 2017. This is a world where Gwen gets the Venom symbiote and becomes Venom Pool Gwen... Gwenum Vin Pool? Gwenum Pool? The name never really gets worked out. She spends most of the issue making goo goo eyes at Matt Murdock before being assimilated by the poisons. The resulting poison Gwen Venom appears in Venomverse issue number 4 later that same year. Number 9. In keeping with her appearances outside the main Marvel Universe, uh, how do I explain not Brand Eck? 
Okay, so released in August of 1967, Not Brand Eck was a comic series that originally ran for 13 issues and featured the tagline, Who says a comic book has to be good? The last issue was cover dated May of 1969, nice, that is until a 14th issue was added in 2017, though it doesn't appear to have been released until early 2018, and man, the cover is the most 2017 thing I have ever seen. They're, they're literally all dabbing. The book was a satirical take on Marvel Comics by Marvel Comics. It was first pitched as a satirical take on DC Comics by editors Roy Thomas and Gray Frederick, but Stan Lee decided they would instead make fun of their own comics. The title is a marketing joke from the era. You see, brands used to refer to their competitors as Brand X, and inside Marvel, they would call DC Comics Brand X. Anyway, I, I have no idea why they made one more issue decades later, nor can I find anyone even attempting to explain it. But it features a story where two very rich Marvel executives, dressed like Monopoly men, create Gwenpool and then cross her with different characters until she's the only character left. Then they fire the creative team for doing what they told them to do, and honestly, it's better than I'm making it out to be. Number 10. If you're already a Gwenpool fan, then you know that aside from her alternate cover debut, her first real appearance was in Howard the Duck Volume 6 Number 1. This was later combined with the Gwenpool Holiday Special into Gwenpool Number 0 and integrated into the unbelievable Gwenpool Believe It trade paperback. The story is called Miss Pool If You're Nasty and spans three parts wherein Gwen stole a dangerous virus from Black Cat, sold said virus to Hydra, attempted to murder Howard the Duck and various other shenanigans. She eventually comes around to a more heroic disposition. What you may not know is that the first run of this issue of Howard the Duck has shot up in value and sells for around $230 in near mint condition, with alternate covers going even higher. Number 11. We're fast approaching, having mentioned every Gwenpool appearance ever at the time of this writing, so let's go for it and check out the 2018 run of West Coast Avengers Volume 3. It was 10 issues long, the first issue is cover dated October 2018, with the last cover dated June 2019. It features MODOK, a mental organism designed only for killing, transformed into a muscle-bound robot man with long blonde hair and rockets in his feet called, and this is real, I swear where Brodoc, or bio-robotic organism designed overwhelmingly for kissing. There's also a guy in a blanket called Dutch Oven. You'll get no more context. This ain't Nerd Sink and I'm no Scott Nice Wonder. Gwen's powers get nerfed pretty hard in this one, as she can't even find the panel of the comic, but like I said before, editorial oversight. Also, Volume 2 has vampires. Number 12. Next, we have 2019's Superior Spider-Man Volume 2, Automatic. This was part of The War of the Realms. I'm just gonna quote Marvel on this one. The Dark Elf Malekith wages a war that has spread from one otherworldly realm to the next, setting them all ablaze, and now it's time for that war to finally explode into the last realm standing, ours. All the worst monsters from the Ten Realms come pouring in over the globe, and it will take the biggest heroes in the Marvel Universe to stop them from conquering Earth. This tie-in sees Superior Spidey and the gang cross over with tons of Marvel's finest, including the Fantastic Four. Number 13. Speaking of the Fantastic Four, Gwenpool Strikes Back has a couple of misadventures before the main plot gets started. In the first issue, she unmasked Spidey. Well, she was trying to get bitten by him to get superpowers? Yeah. In issues 2 and 3, she pals around with Deadpool and decides what she really needs to do is bang one half of Marvel's first family. It's a weird one, but it does make me wonder why Sue and Reed, or Ben for that matter, never recognized Gwen in Superior Spider-Man. It also bothers me that they meet up with Captain America, among others, and Cap asks who they are, even though he called Hawkeye and chewed her out when she reformed the West Coast Avengers using reality TV money, you know, because of the whole Civil War incident. He would definitely be aware of them. Oh god, I've become comic book guy. Number 14. 
So, Secret Empire, Brave New World. This was back when Captain America was a supreme leader of Hydra. He just was, don't worry about it. At the end of issue one, there's a short section that depicts a Hydra propaganda news show where Gwenpool appears as a guest to promote her new book, Help, I've Been Kidnapped by One of Hydra's Weird Bat Soldiers. It's the story of a plucky young girl forced to spread Hydra propaganda. I, I, I'm sure she's fine. Hydra never engages in propaganda. They only tell you the facts. Hell Hydra. There, I said it. I let my family go. <laughs> Number 15. Gwenpool made a very brief appearance in Unbeatable Squirrel Girl Beats Up the Marvel Universe, which, among other awesome things, featured an Iron Man suit full of squirrels pretending to be Tony Stark at a board meeting. Gwen is barely in it. I didn't even see her the first time I read it, but here she is. It doesn't even look much like her, honestly. Number 16. Next, we have Spider-Man slash Deadpool, the comic where you have to pronounce the slash or it doesn't sound right. The series has 50 issues starting in November of 2018 and is mostly a road trip in the Spidey-mobile. Gwen first appears in issue number 42 within Wade's Thought Bubble, but comes to play a much greater role later on. She's in issues number 48, 49, and 50, and frankly, it would take way too long to explain, so just know that the fourth wall gets its shit kicked in and Gwen and Deadpool save the day with comics. Also, the whole book goes insane. I would say that it'll make sense once you read it, but it will not. It's fun though. Now, before we get on to our number one fact, allow me to shout out the rest of Gwen's appearances. Gwen appears as a baby version of herself along with several other heroes in issue number one of Fearless from 2019. And next we have one panel in X Factor volume four, issue three, yeah. Don't worry about it. Then there's X of Swords Destruction number one. I don't think we'll waste time explaining this one either since Gwen is just in this one group shot. After that we have Modok Head Games. Gwen is seen on a monitor in issue number one and there's a surprise reveal of her at the end of issue two, but that's all I will say because this series is still ongoing. Issue number one was released in January of this year, even though it was cover dated March. The latest issue at the time of this writing was number four, released in February and cover dated for April. Gwen is on the cover of issue number three and just all up in them pages. So if you want to get a new Gwen story from your local comic shop, now is the time. And last we have Marvel Voices Pride from 2021. It's exactly what it sounds like, a book for Pride Month and I am all about supporting Pride. All year round, in fact, Gwen's appearance here is just a cameo. Honestly, it's like playing Where's Waldo. Uh, yep, yep, there she is. There's Waldo. Number 17. Christopher Hastings, the writer behind the unbelievable Gwenpool, returned to the franchise for just one page during Gwenpool Strikes Back. In issue number four, he appears as a cloud in the sky and tells Gwenpool that her father's name is a reference to Deadpool. <laughs> Ted Pool, get it? And her mom is called Martha. Yeah like Batman and Superman. Then he said something that kind of blows my mind. To paraphrase, if Gwenpool is from the real world, then how is it that Christopher Hastings named her parents? In the unbelievable Gwenpool, it was flat out stated that she was from the real world, but it really seems like she's from a universe that's very similar to what we think of as the real world. This is why some online sources say that she's from the real world, others say that she claims to be from the real world, and still others simply say that she's from a universe where all the heroes and villains are fictional characters. Like Christopher Hastings said, it's something to think about. So just one more quick thank you to our wonderful patrons on Patreon. You can support the channel at patreon.com slash fancy geeks and get a video made on a comic or character of your choice. If you can't afford Patreon, then you can still be a huge help by sharing this video on Twitter, Facebook, or Reddit. And you can come chat with me directly on Discord, link in the description below. Thank you for making it to the end of the video. And until next time, guys, be kind to each other. I'm Jay Parks.